Thanks everybody for joining us. My name is Cody Mack and uh, today we're going to be talking with Bob Hot Rod Roar about um, thermostatic and any type of mixing valves for hydronic uh, applications. So uh, before we do that we're going to do a bunch of the housekeeping slides to make sure everybody knows uh, exactly what we're doing here. Uh, if you are having trouble with your audio uh, maybe try uh, jumping off and jumping back on again. You can also call the tech support number there. Just remember that's not our tech support number. That's going to be the go-to webinar tech support number. Uh, if you would like a copy of today's presentation, uh, make sure to click yes in the post webinar survey. And if you can't finish the whole webinar today or uh, you got pulled away or anything like that, we do actually put all of these webinars up on YouTube, usually within a week, give or take a little bit. So check those out there. And then for those that do attend live, we will actually provide you with, with a certificate of attendance. So if, again, you are attending live, check for that in your inbox. And if you can use that for uh, any professional development hours, that's fantastic. All right, and we're just gonna take a second to toot our own horn here a little bit. Um, you know, Today we're gonna be talking about mixing valves in hydronic systems, uh, but our finalist here for the AHR Innovation Award in the sustainability category, I believe it was, is our trifecta of products here that includes our Legio Mix, which is an electronic mixing valve for domestic hot water applications. Uh, it also included our under sink mixing valve, we call it the sink mixer, as well as our thermal balancing valve for domestic hot water research applications. So if you have any questions about that, uh, as well as any other mixing applications for domestic hot water, we've got a few webinars uh, that are cataloged on the YouTube channel, but we're also gonna be doing another webinar on domestic hot water mixing in August that I'll be doing with you guys. So make sure to check that out. And if you haven't already, make sure to get subscribed for our hydronics journals. Uh, the most recent one, 30, is going to be for uh, low energy and net zero buildings. 31 is going to be coming out here shortly. And 31 is going to be on pressure reducing valves. So check that out. And then we also offer an interactive version of hydronics at uh, the hydronics.coleffi.com. What's really cool about that is that we can link a whole bunch of other content to these uh, hydronics journals. Uh, not that they're, they're, they're great on their own, but the fact is, is you can add all this other content to it. So we can link the different videos and things like that. So check that out. Uh, again, hydronics.coleffi.com. And next month, uh, we've got some great guests from Lockenvar. We've got Dan and Jennifer talking about uh, heat pump applications for commercial water heating. I think that'll be a really cool one as well. Um, so make sure to check that out. And then uh, I think we're gonna get going here with uh, the mix master, Bob Hot Rod Roar. And uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, make sure to put them in the questions pane and we'll make sure to get to those. If we don't get to them during the webinar, we will contact you afterwards. So uh, take it away, Bob. Well, thanks for the nice uh, intro, Cody, and welcome everybody to Coffee with Coffee. Glad to be back in the driver's seat here with this presentation. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about mixing valves for hydronic applications. We've done, uh, as Cody mentioned, I think five different uh, thermostatic mixing valve um, applications for domestic hot water, and Cody's going to do another one. So if you're looking for more specific information on domestic water, I'll touch on it a little bit as we go through here because they kind of come together at some point, the valves, um, you know, the valves that we have are suitable for both applications. So, um, all right, so mixing. This is what I want to go over today is uh, basically what a mixing valve does, how it operates, how you size them, uh, maybe a little troubleshooting on them, the best place to install them, and uh, just some tips and tricks that I've learned over the years, um, trying all the different types of valves. Uh, a lot of my systems that I've put in over the years, uh, what happens, I'm talking with John Siegenthaler, and we're kind of uh, coming up with different clever ways of doing things and he'll draw something up and then I'll put it together in my shop and try it. So a lot of the pictures that you see in uh, this presentation, also in the hydronics and even some of Siggy's textbooks are uh, applications where I put the system together to prove out the, um, the theory and make sure it works before we, we start uh, talking too much about it. So these are two um, past hydronic issues that we've done that talk specifically to um, mixing valves and hydronic applications they are a little bit older issues, but the, um, the information is still valid. We might have some newer products and you, you will see in the page of those because those were um, a couple years ago that we did those, but um, both of those go into all types of mixing, thermostatic mixing valves, manual mixing valves that we'll be, um, we'll be talking about today. And some of the slides that I used today come out of those two different um, issues that you just saw. 
So, I mean, it really could be this simple here. If you look at, let me move my uh, toolbar out of the way. If you look at these little mixing valves here, this is a, a three-way manual mixing valve, and it's pretty clear on what's happening there. You've got a hot stream coming in on the um, on the upper um, picture there on the left, and um, goes through the valve. There'll typically be a vein or a paddle, we call it in there, that just moves and it changes the mix of the hot and the cold water as you go down through the, the different pictures there. You can see how we bring the return typically coming back from the, um, the system is blending with the hot coming out of the boiler and that's where you get the mixed temperature. So just by moving the position of that little vein or that little paddle in there, you can adjust the temperature going out. And this is still a viable product. I mean, you look at that and say, well, it's pretty simplistic. Isn't there a better way of doing this? But I'll show you some applications where this is still um, a pretty good application of, um, of what we call a dumb valve. You know, it doesn't have any intelligence that it can make a change on its own as it stands there in the picture. But um, I still like this valve for certain applications. So, um, let's see here. Now this here, this, I put don't laugh there, some of these go back before my time a little bit anyways, in the 50s and 60s, you can see different companies have um, different ways of mixing. So you look at that one in the middle, that's actually an old Minneapolis Honeywell before it was called Honeywell, or I guess now Residio or um, whatever it's called these days. But you can see some of these are just basically a restrictor on the very left picture there. You can see they just put a flow restrictor in there, just a typically a disc with a hole drilled in it, like an orifice, that reduces the amount of flow that's going through that um, that circuit there, and that's how they were blending the temperature. So you had to, you didn't have a lot of adjustability in that system there. You had, had to kind of know what kind of flow rates you were expecting to get through the mixing device there and adjust it accordingly. So it was, uh, you know, you just take kind of what you get with that system. And here you can see we put some manual mixing valves, and this is actually pretty popular when we first started doing radiant in the, I would say, late 80s and early 90s. Uh, copper tube boilers were kind of the thing back in those days. And we would use one of these multiple um, valve, manual valves, and you'd have like a T in here, and you'd have these three valves, and you would just keep adjusting them until you got the temperature blended going out that you want. Again, it was a pretty simplistic way of doing it. It didn't offer all the things that we would like to have in a system, like uh, return protection for the boiler. Um, it didn't adjust as a load of the building change and stuff, but um, that's kind of what we knew and that's what we had in those days. And then on the far right here, you can see some of the early Bell and Goss and stuff. Now here's where we started to get into a, a little bit of injection mixing, where we could use a pump and I think probably Gil Carlson started talking about this even back in the, I guess the 60s, uh, about doing some injection mixing using an additional pump just to pulse some high temperature into a lower temperature loop. So these are all um, viable ways of doing it. And some of them will still kind of incorporate some of those a little bit as we go through these slides. So really when we talk about smart valves, we're talking about a valve that has the ability to sense and react to the condition that's going through that valve. So it could be a thermostatic cartridge in there that um, sees the temperatures changing, coming back from the system or the boiler temperatures going up and it can make a correction so that you get the output temperature of that thermostatic mixing valve on the top the gauge on it, which helps set it up properly, um, is going to stay within a couple degrees of what you set on that valve, regardless of what temperature is coming in through the um, return from the system or coming in, uh, maybe the boiler starts to go up on its reset curve or something like that. It's still going to blend this down to the temperature that you desire that you set it for. So it is still the go-to valve, both for plumbing and for hydronic applications. There are some limitations to this valve. I mean, every one of these valves that we'll talk about, there's pros and cons to them. So if you take that valve that we were just looking at previously, that three-way valve, if you wanted to have a little bit more um, control, a little bit more authority with that valve, so to speak, we could put an operator, an actuator, a motor on that. And now we take what we call a dumb valve or a less intelligent valve, I guess is a little politer way of saying that. And just by putting an actuator on it and then driving that actuator from maybe the boiler has a control on board to drive that actuator, maybe you use an aftermarket um, uh, control to so tell that actuator what to do. And it can also be used for diverting applications. We have a valve that um, if you have two heat sources, maybe you've got a, a boiler and a heat pump or a boiler and a solar array or something like that, this valve could certainly be used as a, um, you know, making that selection for you too. All right, so we looked at the three-way valve there on the left, and that's one I happen to have right here in my shop. 
different brands of those that are out there. Um, that one, as you can see, there's bosses that are uh, right in the casting or the forging on that. And that's where you could take that knob off and put the actuator on it and turn it into a, um, a smarter valve by just putting a controller on it. And then over here on the right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna just take and put an additional port on this body of this valve and make this what's called a four port valve. Now there's some advantages of this and you can see right here in the picture what happens. Now this one here, we're taking the hot and the cold and that's our blending or our mixed port uh, point right there. And so we've got a temperature that's blended uh, going out there. If you look at the four way valve, now we've got two blending uh, points in that valve. So we can do two different things with this valve. We could mix the temperature going out to our system, and we could also watch and respond to the temperature going back to the boiler. And we'd probably want to do that on some conditions with a big high mass radiant. We want to make sure that if we're connecting this to a, um, a, ca a cast iron boiler, that's not a condensing type of boiler, that's probably going to be the priority that we protect that boiler from running um, too cold on the return temperature and condensing and uh, destroying the, the boiler and the flue and some of the other components. So while it can watch both conditions, usually the control that's watching that is gonna prioritize and make sure that boiler can uh, get adequate temperatures it runs. So probably looks a little bit better in this drawing right here. So what we would do with this, if we're gonna use this with an actuator, right we would have two different sensors. So we're gonna have a sensor right there on the return to the boiler. This is just a typical cast iron, could be a copper tube boiler, not a condensing boiler. So we've gotta make sure that we keep that return temperature um, high enough that we don't start sweating and condensing this boiler. So that sensor is mo monitoring that temperature and then it'll move the vein inside here to make sure that this blending point right here uh, stays warm enough to provide that that return protection condition. And then the secondary function is up here where it's gonna blend the mixed down temperature going out to our uh, typically radiant uh, slab application. And that too could be set on an outdoor reset control. So if we got a temperature sensor outside here that's monitoring the outside condition, what we could do is we could adjust this valve to respond to the weather condition. So if you look at the little graph right here, you can see as the outdoor temperature starts to drop, we can start ramping up the supply coming out of this port right here, going out to the distribution based on the temperature condition. So most of the time you'll see this is a fairly um, straight slope like that, and you can adjust this up or down the slope. So this picture here, it looks like, uh, it's not on graph paper, but at 70 degrees, obviously we're supplying 70 degree water. Now as it gets colder outside, let's say it's dropping down to uh, 60 degree ambient temperature outside, it looks like we've bumped that up about five degrees on the supply water temperature. So you can fine tune that and sometimes it takes a couple of trips or a couple maybe weeks worth of operation where you could fine tune and you could change the slope of this curve steeper or shallower so that we could increase the temperature more or not as much to we're trying to match the load of that building um, exactly with the output of the you know the distribution going out to it now we would take that or we could take that a step further and give this in addition to this outdoor reset function here we could also give it an in indoor reset function and that would be important on a building that has like a big uh, or often the occupancy change, because what can happen if you're gonna modulate the temperature just based on outdoor conditions? Suppose you have maybe um, you know, an assembly building, a church would be a good example, where Sunday morning it fills up and now you've got all these bodies and they're giving off heat just because the temperature outside is dropping, doesn't necessarily mean that the load on that building is going up because you have that um, heat from all the people inside there. So if you had an input from the indoor uh, thermostat in the building somewhere, it could override this, this condition here where it's saying, wow, it's getting colder outside, I, I should bump up. And well, maybe you don't have to because it is a comfortable temperature inside and you can leave it um, you know, operating with the indoor feedback also. Say, Bob, uh, we had a quick input here too from, from somebody in the questions box. Uh, if, as far as the, some of the products that we offer in North America, I just wanna point this out because he asked about it. We offer three-way mixing valves, but we don't offer four-way mixing valves at this point. Um, but just he, he asked about which products are actually available uh, from Kalefi in North America. But he also noted, and I think you'll have some good input on this, Bob. Uh, he, found, he says he finds that a lot of intelligent controls for mixing valves are not available in North America. Uh, and I'm sure that's much to your dismay, Bob. Well, I mean, yes and no. And, and I will show some of the product that we have to answer these questions as we go to, to answer that question a little bit better with a picture. But yeah, I mean, you know, Techmar is still out there. They're, I 
consider them one of the pioneers, uh, you know, in this outdoor reset control and also mixing valve controls. They still offer the, the valves with the actuators and the control. You really need three components. I think uh, one of the other competitor, the pump companies, um, that we compete with makes a valve that has it built right into the valve also. And I think HBX, I think you've got a picture of that coming up. I think uh, Curtis and the boys out there still offer some uh, controls that can give you all these functions, uh, you know, the valve, the operator, as well as the uh, the control that can run on both indoor and outdoor reset. And they have, I think Curtis now at HBX has, um, actually has thermostats that go along with his systems too that would have that feedback. So you get it all in one package. You get the thermostat that communicates with the box and the box communicates with the valve and the valve communicates with the boiler. So you get everybody on the, on the same page from one, uh, one box or one control. I think what confuses some people sometimes is now we've got the ability in our boilers to do some of this work, and I'll talk about that in the slide, that you can actually run these valves right from the control that's in the boiler. So now a decision has to be made. Do I want to run everything from the boiler? Do I want to run it from a relay box that might have outdoor reset function? Or do I want to go to, a again, a third-party control that can do all this from a, yet another box? So you got to kind of come up with the system you're most comfortable with. If you've been doing, let's say, Tecmar all your career and you're comfortable with the way that works and how to get everything set up and communicating properly, then maybe go with that system. But there's plenty of options still in the in the U.S. that are, um, I see, still on the websites and still available in some of the chat rooms and stuff that people are putting in. So, um, so here's a, a little different picture. So in the previous picture, let me go back to that because there's one other thing I want to explain here. Now, if you've got a boiler that's wide open, and this could be a cast iron boiler, maybe it's electric boiler, you know, it doesn't matter really what the fuel source is, but if it's a boiler that doesn't have much pressure drop to it, you can do this with one pump because this pump can overcome the flow resistance in the circuits in addition to this boiler. In fact, this boiler, this pump could shut off and this boiler will just run up to temperature up to its limit and shut off and it'll be fine. It doesn't need to have constant circulation with like some of the new uh, high efficiency boilers that have got to have a minimum flow rate going through them all the time or you're going to you know, overheat them or start popping a reset control. And we had that a little bit back in the day when we had, um, whoops, when we had copper tube boilers that we were starting to use for um, doing rating applications, some of these, if they had small coils inside of them, say a three quarter uh, copper coils inside there, they had a little bit of pressure drop and you couldn't get by with just a single pump. Those boilers would start to overheat. They'd go into high temperature lockout because you weren't getting enough flow. So I'm still using a, th a four port valve here, but what I've done is I put a pump that's gonna be sized for whatever this boiler manufacturer is telling me that they need uh, for flow rate going through that boiler. They'll typically have a, sometimes they'll even show you the pump brands and part number that you need to put on there, but they'll typically give you the uh, pressure drop through that and also the minimum temperature, uh, the delta T going across that boiler to make sure that uh, that boiler is not going to run too hot and cause problems with it. So here's why I think this valve isn't as popular as it used to be. It costs you another pump in this condition here. So um, number one, we've got ModCon boilers that can handle that low temperature now that we don't need to worry about protecting it with the sensor here and adjusting this valve. But also people say, well, if I could do it with one single pump, um, that's one less pump to you know buy and control and stuff like that. So that's really all I did here is I, I brought a, a you know high pressure drop boiler into the piping and just through an additional pump that sized um, just for that boiler. So yeah, so as Cody mentioned, we do have a couple products uh, still available in our catalog that can um, can do all this for you. In fact, we can use it, offer them with the high efficiency uh, Delta P circulator. So if you're gonna put a bunch of different zones on this, the circulators can modulate based on the zones open and closing. So there you can see one um, with the actuator on it. And here's a manual one. So this knob would come off, the actuator could go on it. So like Cody said, we offer this as a three port valve. It really is a four port valve. We just have it capped off over here. We don't offer it as a four port anymore because um, with the um, actuator on it, it really does everything you need uh, as long as you can drive it. And then over here, you can see this is a really old Tecmar. That's probably a 1990s vintage. Uh, Tecmar four port valve with their actuator on it. And you can see the this one has two connections where you could just screw it right onto the body of the um, 
the valve and then the actuator of course through this wire here has to go over to the control that tells the actuator what to do. So now this here gives us the outdoor reset function, maybe the indoor reset function, and also gives us our return temperature protection. And these, by the way, we've got the hydrolink still available in our catalog, which is like a low loss header, uh, you know, kind of a hydraulic separator. And the spacing on these is intended so you could bolt it right up to that hydrolink and then just go right out to your distribution. So it's got everything kind of plug and play as far as the connections on it and the um, um, we can give you whatever connections that you need going out to your distribution side. Yeah, there you go. Those are, in fact, those are in my shop also. As we speak, those are two older controls from both HBX and an older Tecmar control. And so your sensor inputs and your, uh, you know, your signal to your boiler, everything gets wired right into this one box. All the program is done with the buttons up here. So there's a lot of functionality in both these controls. You can do a lot of things, you know, uh, customize this. And really, if you're going to spend the money and buy a computer is basically what you're buying here, you want to use all the features and functions in there. And you want to give the customer, you know, the best um, control on their system as they can. And like I said earlier, sometimes you have to make a couple trips back to that job to get this dialed in. You might want to shift that curve a little bit, depending on you know what they want for comfort in their house. Everybody's got a different definition of you know comfort, so uh, that's the beauty of this. You can really you know drill down and fine tune them to exactly what they expect out of it. Okay. And so this is another um, technology that we don't see as often. We still have a product for it. This would be an injection mixing. Uh, pump station. So again, it could screw on our hydro mixer or, or uh, hydro link or other uh, primary or secondary piping. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to vary the speed of this pump here. So I'm going to take the high temperature from my boiler and just take a, a portion of that, let's say 180 degree water and just inject it in my distribution side of it. And you can read the temperature here on these gauges. So you can do it with injection mixing. Again, it costs you this pump block to be able to do that. And only if you had, you know, maybe a system that had a bunch of different temperature requirements, you might want to look at doing an injection mixing system. But it's going to give you all the same uh, features and functions as, a, as, you know, as far as being able to dial in the exact temperature, uh, have the control that could base it on the reset and uh, uh, into an outdoor reset function. Now, that being said, there are some of the boilers that are coming, like I said earlier, with controls on them that can do multiple mixing. Here's an example. I think this is the Lock and Var Knight. I've got one sitting behind me as we speak that you can actually do up to three different temperature mixings right out of the boiler control. Now, that being said, on this particular uh, product, you can't do three temperatures at once. So it's going to look at uh, maybe you'll look at the high temperature load. It'll cover that and then it'll switch and reduce the boiler output temperature to cover the other temperature load. So if you want it to run all three different temperatures at one time, you're still going to have to go to a mixing device. And this um, is a Wiesman example over here and you can see they've got three different uh, mixing devices and these could be three different temperatures you could have a low temperature maybe a medium temperature for some under uh, floor plate application and maybe a higher temperature for um, um, you know a high load area of the building or something like that that might need a different temperature and then this could be the temperature directly from the boiler out of the hydro separator and i believe some of the tech mark or um, sorry the Wiesman controls could control everything in this drawing right here right from the um, the boiler control right from the manufacturer. And that a lot of people that do the Wiesman systems like to be able to run everything from one box, from one control, instead of like the previous slides where I showed you bringing in another brand of control, uh, you got to make sure that can communicates with the boiler. So if you can get it all from one brand in one box and you learn how to set those up and use them, uh, that's pretty attractive to be able to, to do it with a one brand solution. Anything else for questions, Cody? I don't want to go too fast here. Make sure that um, if something comes in, feel free to interrupt me. No, we we do have some questions, but we're handling them in the chat. I think you're this is doing great. There was just some questions about uh, you know four way versus three way kind of stuff, and and yeah. three way you know normal versus motorized. But yeah, I think you're you're hitting the nail on the head here. All right. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's nice to have the background answering some questions as we go so we can make sure that we get to everybody uh, during the presentation. So type them in and uh, let us know what's on your mind or input, you know, not just questions. If you have a comment, we'd love to hear. It. So this, I think, is still one of the best applications for uh, doing 
temperature mixing is a thermostatic valve. They've been around a long time. They come in a lot of different sizes, a lot of different um, uh, features you can put on these now as far as fitting connections, temperature gauges, so you can see what's going on. Um, they're certainly a proven device. You know, we've used them for both domestic water applications and radiant applications for 20, 30 years now, and reasonably priced. You know, you don't have to put an actuator on this. Uh, the brains or the intelligent is built right into it. I'll show you some cutaways in a minute. And uh, you can see we've got a wide uh, range of sizes here. And the important number on these, and we'll get to some uh, calculations on this, is the CV. In a perfect world, in a perfect hydronic world or even plumbing world, you would select the valve with the CV, that's the flow rate going through the valve with one pressure drop, that matches exactly what you're doing. So if you had a job that needed three gallons a minute, you'd go to a catalog and you'd buy a three CV valve, and now you're gonna have a valve that can really accurately control that temperature to what you're expecting because you've got good valve authority. The valve's got the ability to regulate at a low flow rate, at a high flow rate, at the design flow rate. Um, what you'll find as you start chopping around, we don't make a valve in a three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten CV. So at some point, you got to interpolate, so to speak. You got to find, okay, would I be better off going to a, let's say I've got a six a gallon per minute load. Should I buy a bigger valve like this that's, a, you know, seven CV? Or am I fine using a three CV valve? Or maybe I can find one a little bit closer with a 3.5 CV. So that's going to be the limitation of a thermostatic mixing valve is how much flow that you can get through this valve. And I'll show you why that is as we look inside one of these valves. So in our catalog, in our tech brochure, there's some pretty important information that you want to look at if you're going to select this valve for really any application, plumbing or for um, a radiant heat mixing valve, for example. And I put arrows by the three most important things. So this one here is the pressure differential. Now, on a hydronic system, we don't usually see issues with this, but where this comes into play, and Cody probably gets us on the, some of the tech support, is if you've got an application with a domestic water mixing valve and you've got it on, let's say, a tankless coil on an old, um, maybe an oil-fired boiler, and the coil starts to get plugged up and you've got a lot of pressure drop going through that um, coil, that boiler, you can fall out of this ratio here where the pressure on the valve side is dropping below and you don't have your two to one ratio anymore. So your cold water is coming in fine at let's say 60 PSI, but when you start flowing higher rates through the tankless coil because it's limed up or a flat plate heat exchanger, the pressure on that side drops off. And what's gonna happen is the valve loses its ability to mix accurately. It doesn't shut down and say, okay, no water for you. It just starts to get um, a little bit crazy, if, if you will. You know, the temperature might be just right, and then it might go a little high, then it might go a little low. The valve is hunting. It's hunting around for the perfect uh, spot for that to be. And because it's not getting this ratio of temperature to it, you're not gonna get a stable mixed temperature. And that would apply for the second point right here. You want to make sure that the minimum temperature difference between the hot water coming from, let's say, your boiler and the mixed temperature coming out of the third port right here, we'd like to see a 27 degree temperature differential. So let's say, for example, that you want a 120 degree mixed temperature coming out to it. Ideally, we'd like to see 147 degrees on the hot port coming into it to be able to give you a good resolution, again, so that valve can be accurate. Now, if this drops off and you get down to 25 or 22 or even 20 degree differential, the valve is still going to operate. It's just, again, it's going to start hunting around a little bit more, and you might notice on the temperature gauge that it's, you know, it's exactly what I want one second, and it's going up maybe three or four degrees, and it's dropping behind three or four degrees. Again, the valve is hunting around for that sweet spot because it doesn't have enough differential for the hot and cold to be able to um, uh, to perform. And then this last one here, the minimum flow rate, um, same thing there. It applies to how much flow is going through the valve so the valve can operate. And when I show you a cutaway, I think this is going to make a little bit more sense why these three points are, uh, why we put them in there, number one, and why what they mean and uh, how you can avoid having a problem with that. So here's one more product that we make. Some people say, well, can you just give me the whole thing in one enchilada? And we can. So here's an example where we've got the manifold for your distribution. Uh, we've got an ECM pump in this case here, so it can vary its speed based on the different ports opening and closing if you put actuators on here. We've got a thermostatic mixing valve in here, and we actually even put a little hydraulic separator in here. This little H-shaped um, 
valve or body right in here is actually a primary secondary loop rig built right into the, the whole thing. So if you're gonna hook it up onto a boiler like this picture right here, um, then you would have that little hydraulic separator right in here. So this pump can get adequate flow as the zones open and close. If you're gonna connect it to a system that has a hydraulic separator, in this case, we're just showing it with a buffer tank. It could be a hydrolink, could be a hydraulic separator, could be a primary secondary piping. Then you wanna take this little H valve out. You don't need this primary secondary if you already have primary or secondary accomplished. So as you can see, there's a couple nuts right here. And we get this occasionally where people say it's not mixing properly. We have to uh, ask them how they piped it or send us a picture of how you put it in there. And you have to take this little H valve out and then these valves would just move up. Still have your isolation valves, but you just drop this out of the picture. Anything you wanna go into on that, Cody? I'm gonna get a drink, a drink of water here. If you... Yeah, don't take a breather there, Bob. Yeah, so when we talk about the, the manifold with the built-in uh, circulator mixing valve and everything else, uh, yeah, the biggest question we get in a lot of cases is this: if this is being used, is that you know I don't get any hot water to my valve, and and like you mentioned, by using that H fitting, which is basically just a hydraulic separator, um, you know the 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 basically the circulator is just bypassing right through that um, that hydraulic separator fitting and by pulling it out of there it allows that circulator to pull from the domestic hot or the, excuse me the the hot water source uh which could be your boiler or your buffer tank or whatever the case may be so um so yeah that's about the biggest one there this, these are really common applications um when you've got high temperature uh cast iron an older house and maybe they're doing an add-on for the house and they they wanted to you know add on a living room with with in-floor or kitchen with in-floor or whatever these are really a, a a great little option for you yeah that's a good point if you do have a high temperature system and they say well can you put some radiant in my kitchen or my basement or addition uh shown here maybe a panel radiator or cast iron radiator that's running at you know 180 or whatever the temperature might be you can just tie this right into that same temperature loop and uh, get your mix down temperature we offer it, I think, both ways with the regular pump and also the Delta P pump. So the nice thing about the um, the variable speed pump is the ports start to open and close. The pump uh, will speed up or slow down, so you get just the right amount of flow going out to all the loops all the time. So it makes it a really uh, kind of like putting a cruise control on your uh, on your distribution system. All right, so um, we talked about the. Um, the other manual valves now let's get inside one of these thermostatic valves now know too that the cleppy valves we can get you in press we can get you sweat and we can get npt or we can mix and match those so it makes it a little bit easier to put inside there so this valve could also be used for return uh, protection you could set this at let's say you wanted 130 degrees maintained at your boiler all the time on the return you could actually pipe this right in on the return and uh, it's going to provide your return protection so Here's what's going on inside a thermostatic mixing valves, and it's gonna be any brand of mixing valve. This isn't unique to the Cluffy brand, but it's gonna have this little device in it here, and it's sometimes called a heat motor, a thermal cartridge, um, a thermostatic sensor, and basically, I'll show you a cutaway this next. It just has a little compound in here that as this heats up and cools down, this little, um, it's called a piston coming out of the top of it here, moves up and down. And then as it does that, it moves this spool inside here. And as you can notice that the um, the hot window is at the bottom here and the cold window is at the top. So as this spool moves up and down, it's closing one window as it opens the other window. And that's how it's making its temperature um, adjustment or doing the temperature blending. A uh, couple things that you notice in this picture, there's quite a bit of commotion inside this valve. And that's why these valves typically have a fairly low CV because there's just so much stuff that we have to put in here. The springs, the spring at the top, the spring at the bottom, you've got a cartridge here. You've got another, um, we call this a cylinder. This is the piston that moves up and down inside of this one. And then the water actually comes in all around us. These little, you know, it's a cutaway, but these little passageways here is where the water comes in and then it goes down through the, the heat motor, the cartridge here, and this is gonna move up and down make that temperature adjustment by opening and closing ports and then go out here. And so this is probably a good picture to show why it's so important that you have enough flow going through this valve because we need to have a turbulent flow condition around this little heat motor. We want water to be moving all around us on all sides of it so that entire uh, copper capsule can be in contact with the water and it can respond. If you have a valve and you don't have enough flow coming through that valve and it's just maybe going down the sides of it and it's not mixing all around this good, you're not getting a turbulent condition, 
that's when that valve starts losing its ability to be accurate because this valve is saying, well, I think I've got a hot water condition. I'm going to open up a little bit more, close down a little bit more. Um, it has to do with the, um, the heat motor not getting enough flow around it to make that accurate adjustment. So yeah, as I always do, I had to cut one open, see how exactly what's inside there. And it's uh, uh, just as they tell you, it's wax with a little bit of a, looks like ground up or pulverized copper inside there. So it makes a good conduction to this copper um, sheath, if you will, that's around the outside of it. So um, if you were to warm this up, you will see that, um, that that piston would move up as the wax you know, heats up, expands and pushes on that little diaphragm in there. And that's what pushes the, um, the piston up and makes the, the correction. And, Oddly enough, that can happen within a couple seconds time. In fact, some of the standards for the accuracy of this valve dictate a time that it has to be able to respond and make a correction. And that would be on a, you know, a final protection valve, for example, if you've got a high temperature flow condition coming to a faucet, you certainly want this valve to respond quick enough that somebody isn't gonna get um, scalded, uh, you know, if they're washing their hands or something like that and the water changes temperature, um, you want this valve to be able to respond and make the correction almost instantly. So these are the two valves that um, are go-to valves from Clef, the 521 mix kale there on the left. And this is a fairly new valve for us over the past, what, maybe five years now, Cody, that we've had what we call this angle mixer. And I thought this was an interesting picture that what we've done with this new angle mixer, in addition to making uh, you know, the flow passageway through it at an angle so it can be um, a straight through design, we've taken some of the, the stuff out of the valve so it is a little bit quicker responding valve. So instead of having to move as much um, piston inside the cylinder here, as you can see, this is a little uh, slim down version of it. So this is a very responsive valve. This is a great valve if you're doing tankless water heaters, if you're doing tankless coils because it it's a very accurate valve and it's also a quick responding valve, but it can also be used in hydronics for the same reason as, you know, it can um, have a little bit better flow rate in the larger body version of it. I'll show you here in a minute. We've actually got a 3.5 uh, CV version of this valve, so it would make a great um, mixing valve for hydronic applications too. And we can, uh, like all the other valves, we can put whatever connections you need on the, um, on the different three ports to it. Yeah, and I'll jump the gun here a little bit for you, Bob, so you can take a quick drink or anything like that. Um, anytime you're using a thermostatic mixing valve in, in hydronic applications, sizing is very important. And and uh, yeah, it's, you got to be really careful with some of these. Just because it's a three-quarter inch connection doesn't mean you know it's going to be able to really support that five or six gallons per minute that you might need. Uh, but again, Bob will Bob will probably go over that here shortly. So yeah, no, that's a good intro to it, and so I remember to do that. But we do have um, I do have some slides, and I even have a little um, a little Excel cheat sheet that I can uh, make available to you folks that you can do your own calculation. So there again, exploded views of them, and I just showed down here the two different. Um, uh, CV ratings on this, we have a small and a large body version of this, so make sure if you're looking for that high CV that you order the um, the larger body of it, and it does have bigger connections on it too, so make sure you select your fittings for the whatever you want to connect to it. Maintenance on these, now both of these were domestic water valves, and you could expect that you're going to see some of this lime scale inside the valve it's not going to handle that very well for very long. This valve here needs to be delimed. Now, we used to sell repair kits. We just sell the whole body because even if you took this valve apart and put a new repair kit in it and you didn't address this line buildup that was inside of that, you're still going to have problems with the valve. So we found it's better to just, we can sell you just the body only. You don't have to buy all the new fittings, but it's pretty hard to expect somebody out in the field to be able to get all this lime scale out of that, um, inside of that valve so that if you put a rebuild kit in it, it can move up and down. And here's an example of, uh, I don't know exactly what was in the water that caused it to just eat away the O-rings on here because these are pretty, um, these are peroxide cured uh, EPDM O-rings that they're pretty stable to most um, water conditions that uh, you should be drinking anyways. But that came back to us as a, as a failed valve. It wasn't obviously working properly, but um, it probably didn't leave the factory looking like that. So yeah, you just have to, uh, you have to know what's going through your valve and you have to maintain the valves if they are used on applications where the water's changing or um, domestic water applications, certainly with hard water. 
And so, like I said, we used to have a, a rebuild kit where you could take this apart. But the other thing that we found is, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has to go in there just a certain way. And if they got put together wrong, then we'd have a call. Well, just put a rebuild kit in. It still isn't working. Uh, it's just easier to change out the body. And these small valves, anyways, these are just um, easy to do. This is a little kit I made that you could actually run a cleaner through them. You know, I just took some of the delimer from a tankless water heater kit and just ran it through there. But again, I don't know that you would do that at a customer's house. It's probably going to be uh, more cost effective just to put a new body in the valve and then they've got all new components. All right, so here's an example what where it starts to go south a little bit when people use thermostatic mixing valves on hydronic and they don't pay attention to the sizing, the CV on it. So let's say we've got a uh, anticipated rate on this. We've got what, 12 ports there, I think, or 13 ports on that manifold and one GPM. So um, if you look at a 3C valve and you put a 12 GPM flow rate through it, what you're going to find is you're going to have a lot of pressure drop going through that valve. It's just there's just not enough room to get 12 gallons a minute through that comfortably. So what's going to happen is you're just going to start starving. As these, let's say you've got actuators on these, and as more zones open up, you're just not going to be able to supply enough uh, fluid through that, or you're going to end up with a, a supersized pump that can overcome the pressure drop. So what you can do is if you know what your design load is, and you should, you can just put that into a, uh, a calculator and determine that. And this is, uh, like I say, Mike Schreiner, our engineer, put this together. It's a very simple, easy to use calculator. So what I would use is this third box over here. And I would put the CV in my valve in. And so I've got a three CV valve. Then I put the flow rate that I'm trying to get through that. And I've got a 12 gallon a minute. We're using that example I just showed you on the previous slide. And you can look at the pressure drop through that valve. Now you got almost 37 feet ahead <laughs> that's probably not a very realistic pump to be um to be using on that valve and you're going to have some pretty high flow velocity going through that valve also when you start driving it to that condition so just because the piping coming to it and the you know the system demands that 12 gallons a minute doesn't necessarily mean the valve can handle that so what i would encourage you to do when you have an application find out what the design flow rate is and then just plug it into this calculator now this calculator you can also use to troubleshoot if you've got a job and you can measure the delta p or something like that and you want to you know what the cv of the valve is i can predict exactly how many gallons per minute i'm going to get through that valve under those conditions so a gauge across both sides of your circulator measuring your delta p across that circulator at 16 psi i know it's a 3 cv valve says so, so right on the cap um, I know that I'm getting 12 gallons a minute through it. So you can use this formula, you know, one of three ways, but most of the time for sizing, either for domestic water, for hydronic applications, uh, you're gonna use this pressure drop box right here. And know that this could be used for any of our valves. It could be a mixing valve, it could be a pressure reducing valve, it could be a balancing valve. If you know the CV, of the, it could be a ball valve. If you know the CV of that ball valve and you know how much flow you're gonna put through it, this, um, this calculator will predict what your pressure drop is going to go through that, both in feet ahead and also a PSI of pressure drop. And it's based on this formula. If you like to do longhand math, uh, there it is right there. So let me know if you want that. I can uh, I can send that to you as a, a PDF link or something. Hey Bob, I would just mention too that you know you know when you talk about CV and everything like that and the size of the valve and you know putting that big flow rate through there and needing a big pump. And I think, you know, how I always kind of boil it down is, do you want to spend money on a bigger mixing valve or do you want to spend money on a bigger pump? And not only spend money on a bigger pump, but spend money on operating that pump for the life of that system too, uh, or as long as you keep that tiny little mixing valve in there. So, I mean, it's one of those things where I think, I think the money is better spent on, on a larger mixing valve to get that, you know, the, the energy requirements down for that mix or for that circulator. So. Yeah, I'm sure you agree. Add to that code is if let's say the guy said, well, why don't I just buy a two inch mixing valve here? Then I know I've got, you know, what, 14 CV or whatever our two inch valve is. But if you have a condition where only one or two of these is opening and you've got that big valve, now you're going to lose your low end stability on your temperature regulation. So you got to get that valve as close as possible to what the application requires. If you go too big, you lose your low end resolution. If you go too small, like Cody said, you're going to have to get a a supersized pump just to be able to get the overcome this pressure drop going through it so there comes a point when maybe it's better to go into a different type of mixing valve if you know you need those high flow rates and you don't want to use the high flow pump and you don't want to um, have you know flow velocity noise issues uh, maybe it's time to go to a, a you know a, 
one of the manual mixing valves or motorized mixing valve where you've got a much wider port and stuff. So what I did here, just to show you an example, how even a small a change in the CV going from a three gallon a minute or a three CV valve to 3.5, I put them both into the same condition here and you can see made quite a bit of difference on the pressure drop going through the valve. So maybe just going up to this valve here, if you've got that, you know, let's call it maybe a five or six gallon per minute uh, flow requirement, uh, this valve is going to put you in a better uh, spot for, you know, your pump sizing and your pressure drop going through the valve. And that's why we offer that calculator. Just you know, two inputs and you got your answer. You, you know, you don't have to calculate or put it in the job and find out that it's not keeping up on a demand day that they're falling behind because you're just not getting the, the flow that you expect. And so the other thing that would come into that, and this is another table I found on the uh, engineering toolbox. That's another great website. They've got a lot of free calculators on there. And I like this one here because you can pick the different types of pipe. And in this case for copper, it actually shows type K, L and M. Typically in a heating system, we'll use a type M because what I found is there's some other valves, some competitors valves out there where they'll show a 22 gallon per minute flow rate through a three quarter valve. And I'm saying, well, what would happen if I tried to put 22 gallons a minute through a three, three quarter copper pipe? Well, you can see right here, they can take that table down that far. But if you look at this, Really what you want to do is be in the sweet spot of four feet per second maximum velocity. So you can see, let's take that 3.7. You can see I'm only going to get six gallons a minute through a three quarter copper pipe. So, you know, even if I have a 12 gallon a minute flow rate, you're not going to handle that with your three quarter copper pipe anyway. So two things are pointing to the bad selection. Number one, you've got too low CV of a valve and you're you know, the copper tube size going to that valve isn't going to accommodate that flow rate anyway. So use all these tables together, um, you know, your pressure drop tables, uh, your pipe sizing tables to make sure that you're, you know, coming up with the right answer, the right solution for, for what you need to deliver to the job. Now, um, <clears throat> same thing here. Here's an example where um, this valve, um, is being used for a thermostatic mixing valve. And what we want to do is we always want to pull through the valve. We want to have our circular pump so that it's pulling both the cotton cold through the valve, getting your blend point right there and pulling it through. This isn't the best way to pipe a thermostatic mixing valve. Yeah, the flow is still going to round here, but you're not pulling evenly through the A and B port to get a good mixing temperature. So always pump away from the mix port. Now, some valves, uh, other brands maybe, they aren't always A and B and AB in this configuration. So just pay attention that the valve you buy, they might have it uh, inverted that you've got your mix temperature here and this is your A and B. It's not always the T port that's your um, mix temperature, which we call the A and B port because obviously you're mixing your A and B temperature. So just pay attention to the um, either the, the label on the valve. It might have an H and a C. It might have an A and a B and an AB, but make sure that if you switch brands or something that you're <laughs> you're getting them piped properly. But yeah, always pump away from, pump out of the thermostatic mixing valve. Now these are other uh, mixing uh, possibilities. So here we've got an example, we've got a thermostatic mixing valve and we're just pulsing on a, um, a zone valve. We're just gonna pulse that valve on and off to get the temperature blending coming out of this high temperature loop here, going to our mixed temperature loop. I don't see that um, very often. There were some companies that made a package that had this little, um, that was actually a thermal actuator valve so they could control it accurately and they would just pulse it open to uh, do your mixing, kind of like an injection mixing a little bit, but just using the pulse uh, signal here. Another one here with a, a motorized, like a zone valve, this could be here that you just open it up until the temperature comes up at this mix point here and you get what you want uh, based on the sensor here. And uh, this one here, the variable speed, where I'm just going to rev this pump up and down to take enough of the high temperature out of my uh, my primary loop here and inject it in my low temperature. So all viable options yet. It just seems like uh, the thermostatic mixing valve or one of the manual mixing valves uh, can do this a little bit uh, cleaner, a little bit more accurately. Now, let me go back to this one. So here's an example of a, uh, sorry about that. Uh, an example, we've got um, a valve here and a valve on the distribution side. So this valve here is going to run on outdoor reset. And I really like this. I've actually done this on two of my own 
um, jobs in my own house, my last shop, and also at the house I've got uh, that I'm sitting at right now. And so what's going to happen here is this motorized mixing valve is going to follow the outdoor reset control, maybe the indoor reset control, and it's going to blend the temperature going out. So this here is going to get its blended temperature based on what's going on with the motorized mixing valve. And down here, I've taken what we call, again, a dumb manual mixing valve. And what I'm going to do with this valve is when I get this thing up and running, get my boiler up to temperature, to get this valve dialed into the temperature that I need up here, I'm going to go down and manually adjust this valve until I get that I'd have a temperature gauge here, get the temperature going out to this uh, distribution here, blend it down to the temperature they want, which is probably going to be a little bit lower than this. And so what's going to happen if you look over here on the reset is this valve is going to follow along with that valve. So instead of putting another valve with another actuator, another operator, another um, reset control, this is just going to ride along with the reset on this. And it actually tracks pretty nicely. Again, this valve is just going to go along uh, for the ride with what the output of this uh, motorized mixing valve is going to be. And this could be injection mixing. It could be any of the other mixing devices. But this is my smart valve. And my other valve is just following the lead of the smart valve. And so it saves you a little bit of money sometimes. It's just a simple way to uh, get a two temperature mix with um, one of them being on the outdoor reset and the other one just going along with it. Okay. Yeah, we talked a, a, a little bit about what happens when you have a valve that can't respond, that doesn't have the ability to change its output as the flow rate changes. And you could follow through all these numbers. You can see as the flow rate changes through that valve and the zone valves open and close, which is causing the flow rate to change. We've got a delta P circulator here. So as the valves open and close, it's going to change its flow rate to match whatever the load is on it. But your temperatures are going to change going out to your distribution because the valve can't make that correction. So if you want a fixed temperature, regardless of what conditions going on over here, you're not going to get it with this valve. That's where it comes, uh, comes time to put an actuator on that if you want to make sure that whatever condition, whatever zone valves are open, you're always getting that um, designed temperature out to it. You got to have the actuator on it. Okay. Yeah, so this is an example of uh, where you can use two valves together um, for the different uh, two different temperatures. I could have two thermostatic valves here. I could have a you know a manual valve here, and I could have a thermostatic valve here. In the plumbing applications, we'll put, sometimes put two valves together in what's called a high-low system, and this would be a solution for where you've got um, wide differences in the flow rate. Let's say you've got an application where the building might go down to a half gallon a minute flow rate at certain conditions where there's just a hand sink maybe flowing in the middle of it or something like that. And then you've got a high load at a certain point of time. You can just put two valves in parallel like this, and this valve will do most of the work. And then when the pressure drops off, since here, this valve will open, and actually both valves will work at that condition. The same thing could happen in a hydronic system where I could pipe two valves like this and give me two different uh, uh, blended temperatures. And I could actually have two different reset curves on that. If I wanted a different, you can see the slope of the two resets here changes a little bit. If I wanted a different slope on this on my reset, I could have a motorized valve here and adjust that for you know maybe a low temperature radiant where this is shown as a maybe a fin tube or a panel radiator application where I want my shift to be a little bit more aggressive. You can see the steeper slope here. Um, I can set the two different reset curves. Somebody asked, in fact, I added this slide because somebody in one of the pre-submitted questions said, well, what about constant recirculation? Uh, if I turned on my camera, you would see this is right behind me right now. So what I've done here is I've taken right off my hydraulic separator and I put in a three-way uh, zone valve. As you can see again, A port, B port, AB port. And basically what happens is my pump is running all the time. I've got a little pump that's it's only running about 17 watts right now because it's an ECM pump, and I'm always having flow going through my loops out here. And this does a few nice things. Is number one, it gives me a real even floor temperature. So now my thermostat isn't telling the boiler and the pump to come on, and now I got to catch up with the load. Maybe I open my garage door here and it gets cold in here. The thermostat comes on. Now I get the slab back ramped up to temperature. By using constant circulation, I've always got flow going through those tubes. So if it's, what is it, 62 degrees in here right now, uh, I've got that going through my floor and all the loops. So if I get a, uh, a call for heat, and let's say my outdoor reset says, okay, I'm going to give 80 degree temperature, I'm starting from my floor temperature now. I'm not starting from a cold uh, startup condition. 
Um, the other thing, if I've got solar gain, let's say I've got a building where I've got the big south facing windows and the sun comes in and it warms up that concrete slab, I might want to move that energy out to my other loops. So by having the constant circulation, I'm taking advantage of any uh, passive solar gain that's coming in there and putting it into the rest of my uh, the rest of my loops or the rest of my uh, uh, my room there by just grabbing that and letting that pump run all the time. The main reason I did is for freeze protection. I didn't want to put, I, you know, I just don't like glycol if, unless you absolutely positively need glycol for piping outside or some condition like that. So with this pump running all the time, uh, if I leave the door open and I leave or something like that, I've always got flow through the pipe. It would take a pretty cold condition uh, to freeze up a building if you've got flow going through all the pipes. Now you say, well, what if the power goes out? You don't have freeze protection. Well, what you could do, especially with these ECM, uh, circulators, I could just put a little computer backup. It wouldn't take much of a computer backup with a battery to, to run, what, 40 watts at design condition on this pump. Uh, so I would have a, the pump running even in a power outage and making sure that I've got, uh, that I don't freeze the tubing in my slab. And so basically the way this works is when I have a call for heat, the call for heat tells the zone valve to go to the other position, allows the temperature to come out of my um, my boiler, out of my hydraulic separator here and go into it. And then when the valve calls for heat, the end switch turns on my boiler and the boiler's on outdoor reset. So call for heat, opens the thermostat, end switch turns on the boiler, the boiler's running an outdoor reset. It's a very simple uh inexpensive way to get constant circulation. Just use a, a three-port zone valve and uh, have your thermostat connected to the zone valve. Okay. Oh, we got about five minutes here. I think I got more slides. So this is something uh, we talked about using the valve for a diverting valve. So this is a product that we actually make uh, uh, for the solar applications. And if you look at what's happening here, I've got three thermostatic mixing valves and they're all built into one um, forging or one body here. And so what this does here, it chooses between two different input applications and we made it specifically for solar. So let's say you've got a solar system running today and it's warm enough to supply the heat to your building or to your domestic water. And it's just going to come through that mixing valve and go right out to the system. Now, it will go through the third mixing valve in case the solar gets too hot. I don't want to send 160 degrees solar water going out to my faucets if that's what it is. This third valve here will regulate the temperature. Uh, so we built one of those. You can just take three mixing valves. These happen to be three Calefi, um our solar mixing valves and just put them together in this configuration. So one is doing the diverting, it's selecting when the temperature is warm enough from one source to the other, going to the other source, and then it's also mixing the temperature down for your final protection. So we're using the valves as both um, diverting and mixing valves in this application. You could do it with two valves also. If you didn't have to worry about the final temperature going out, you could just use two valves as diverting valves to choose between the, um, the two loads. So. Um, yeah, I think we talked a little bit about fluid quality. These were um, hydronic applications. You can see by the rusty water, probably hooked to a uh, maybe a cast iron boiler, maybe had some ferrous uh, metal piping or something in it. And you can see this valve is just plugged up with the junk from the water. Um, again, that's not the valve's fault. That valve is going to have to be replaced. I wouldn't even try to clean out a valve that looks um, looks like that when you take it apart to uh, find out why it's not mixing properly. I will say the Cleffy valve, we've done quite a bit inside here to make it um, tolerant of bad, harsh water conditions. Number one, you can see our body's quite a bit bigger than some of the other brands. Uh, we make this really slippery inside the bore of this um, body here, and that's so that this um, can slide up and down and make the uh, temperature adjustments inside there. If you can keep the spool inside here uh, slick and you can keep the O-rings in good condition, uh, the valve can operate go up and down smoothly and then it doesn't stick because what happens when a valve sticks on these o-rings here and it can't go up and down freely or smoothly it's going to jump in temperature so the temperature will be exactly where you want it and then it jumps like five degrees and then it jumps back a couple degrees it's this spool trying to move through this junk inside there and it's just um it's just kind of a jumpy movement instead of a nice uh, flow movement i got one more slide here all right so the bottom line uh, yeah, you could do it with a couple ball valves piped together if you take the time and patience. Just know that when you use a manual valve, whether it's a couple ball valves or even the manual three and four port valves, you're setting that up for one specific condition. Let's say your boiler's at 180 degree, uh, the load going out to your building is requiring 90 degrees, you got it dialed in and you leave and you get a call back the next day that, you know, 
we're not keeping up. Well, the load on the building went up and you've got that set so it can only <laughs> send out 80 degree water to it because it's fixed in that position. So that's where you're gonna find the problem with the manual type of mixing valves. Um, we talked about the valve injection mixing with either pulse and a um, uh, zone valve or putting a thermostatic, uh, like a TRV on that and with a sensor on it that can do that. We talked about the variable speed injection. Uh, we talked about the boiler being able to drive the mixing valves or actually uh, provide a mixed temperature right from the control itself. And we talked about the, uh, the advantages of having both the indoor and the outdoor input so you can really fine tune a building, especially a building that sees uh, big uh, changes in requirements in its temperature in a short period of time. So to make a long story long, I think. <laughs> No, you did good. You hit the nail on the head there, Bob, for the one hour time frame. So, uh, no, I, I think you made a good point at the top here as well. You know, as far as uh, different temperatures for mixing and stuff like that, you know, anytime you get like 10 to 15 degrees apart for for uh, temperature, supply water temperature requirements, obviously a, a different mixing zone is going to be required. But, you know, just kind of keep that in mind, too, when you're when, you know, these systems are getting designed. If it comes back that like this zone needs 103 and this zone needs 106 or whatever, you know, like maybe add a little bit of emitter or something like that and try and get it all on one temperature zone because it's just going to make things a lot less uh, uh, complicated, I guess, is is the better thing to put put towards it. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah, that's an excellent way to put it, Cody, because you're right. You know, most of the design programs, especially for radiant floor heating, it will let you tighten up the tube spacing or, you know, add another loop or something and get those temperatures as close to one another as you can. And then, then you don't need a mixing station. That seems to be the rule of thumb, Cody. I think 10 to 15 degree uh, yep. temperature difference between them, then you got to add another mixing station in. But yeah, I mean, if you can, you know, tweak the system that you don't have to put as much mixing in, that's uh, save the day. Yeah. And I think one of the other big ones too, especially when using three-way mixing valves, uh, you know, something that I'll throw in here, um, you know, you mentioned it before that you always want to pump away from a mixing valve. You know, you want to have that circulator on the mixed outlet side pumping away from that mixing valve. I would say another kind of good rule of thumb is anytime, you know, especially with existing systems and stuff like that, if you've got an existing system and you are going to put another zone on there that's going to be a different temperature and you're using a mixing valve, you have to add another circulator too. Um, there's there's no way that you can just add a mixing valve and have one circulator doing high temp and low temp at the same time. It's literally impossible. So, you know, always pump away from a mixing valve and then always uh, always add a circulator if you're adding a mixing valve as well. So. Yeah, if you think what Cody said, we always want to have flow going across that mixing valve too, so that it can have a hot supply. If it doesn't have new hot water coming to it, then obviously it can't uh, it can't blend uh, the cold coming back and make a good mixing. So we need flow across the valve, and we need flow going out to the distribution. It's going to take two pumps. So. Yeah, so oh. we ha we had quite a few good questions uh, come in through the questions pane. I think we got to most of them, but if we didn't get to you, uh, we'll definitely make sure to get to you afterwards. There were some that were a little bit more in depth than what we wanted to go on here, uh, but make sure to tune in with us uh, next month. We're going to have our guests from Lockenvar coming through, and if you guys have any questions regarding Kalefi product, a lot of you guys I know uh, from emailing me personally and everything like that. So uh, you know, definitely check us out, uh, call us, shoot us an email. We'll be happy to help you out with any applications questions we've got a great team here in Milwaukee and uh, we also I think the next slide here is about our podcast if you're all about listening to podcasts while you're droning out and, you know driving your service truck or on your way to work or whatever the case may be Greg and Dan have done a great job with our podcasts on a wide range of topics from plumbing to heating uh, and everything in between so definitely check out our podcast and then we also have a, a pretty cool little production that I do. It's called The Five Things You Need to Know. It's going to be a short little uh, five to eight minute video typically on various topics. Um, so definitely check that out as well. Uh, it's for those with the shorter attention spans and you're looking to get the, the most information in a quick period of time. And, and it's a, a great little resource for you guys. And also make sure to check us out on social medias. Uh, we always like to see pictures of installations and everything like that using our products and, and see how creative of you guys can get in the field and everything like that uh so definitely check us out there and uh if there's anything else uh have a great day and bob thank you so much for your time well yeah thanks everybody for tuning in thanks to my team in milwaukee and everywhere else that supports me and helps me through these and uh we'll look for you on the next one and yeah call us or email us if you need anything we'll be glad to help have a great day guys bye-bye